Um, I want to welcome to the stage Anya Lehman from the University of Potsdam. She's also a co-author of the Cryptographer's Feedback on the EU Digital Identities Architecture and Reference Framework, and she'll be talking about her work there and also the, you know, that, that Cryptographer's Feedback. Thanks, thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, so the European Digital Identity is a very ambitious project going on in Europe at the moment. And at the core of it is what's called an identity wallet. That is an app that is supposed to be fully mobile, secure and user friendly, and should enable users to um, authenticate and identify in online and offline scenarios. And at the beginning, this will mainly be an appified version of your national EID. So you can use that then to um, access public and private services that need, really need to verify your identity, for instance, if you want to open a bank account. But in the long run, this is supposed to contain all sorts of attested attributes, starting from a driver license to educational certificates, insurance, travel, payment, and so on. And then the idea is that this enables you to transmit verifiable attributes to relying parties that need them for their services. And in order to ensure that this thing is getting traction, um, major services that one operates in the US and uh, in Europe, in particular uh, major gatekeepers such as Google and Apple, will be mandated to accept the sign-in with the EYDI wallet as a means to authenticate and access their services. And that is not kind of a bold vision um, that Europe has. This is under actual development right now. Because the EU regulation, EIDAS, that describes all that, already entered into force in May last year. And all, it also sets a very ambitious timeline that now says that all EU member states must provide such a um, wallet to all their citizens by the end of next year. And this EIDOS regulation doesn't only set the timeline and the functionality, but it also describes what the security and privacy guarantees of such a um, wallet should be. And while we're not kind of, we were not really happy with the first version of it, so I think many of us here signed the first uh, open letter in, um, a while ago, you will, I think, be quite surprised um, how much privacy is actually written in there. So let's look at that. So what they kind of say is that if you want to authenticate to relying parties, you should do that in a way that allows you to selectively disclose exactly the, the minimal amount of, of information that you need there. You must be able to authenticate service in a pseudonymous way and everything should be unlinkable and unobservable if you're not identifying yourself. And if you look a bit closer, they really mean that serious. It really says that the technical framework shall, which is essentially a must requirement, not allow providers of this attestation to obtain any information that allow user behavior to be tracked or linked. There is an annoying typo though in there. Um, let's see, can you see it at the, at the bottom? Um, in the very last version, they changed unlinkability to unlikability. <laughs> um, I really hope that this is just a typo and not kind of an evil master plan. Um, but I think overall, this is really great news. It really says we have a law in Europe that mandates that identity must have had really high privacy standards. But that is also just the law. Um, and the law just says what should be done, but not how. And this is now kind of developed in these architecture reference framework in the ARF and in the implementing acts. And this is now where the good story ends. Um, because instead of using any of the technology that we have developed exactly for that use case, they decide to build everything from ECDSA. So maybe they did mean unlikability after all. Um, okay, but let's look how they try to get selective disclosure and unlinkability in there. Um, so of all the setup is not surprising. A credential is a signed list of attributes from a trusted authority, the identity provider, that signs the attributes and the user public key. And in order to get selective disclosure in there, the identity provider isn't signing all attributes at once, um, but with individually salted hashes. So then if the user um, forwards the credential, she can decide whether she wants to forward just the hash of an attribute or the salt and the uh, attribute. And that gives you selective disclosure. It's not the most beautiful uh, solution, but it does the job for selective disclosure. One thing you always have to reveal though is your user public key, because what you also have to do on top is to do a proof of possession that you know the underlying secret key, which is again yet another ECDSA signature of a session nonce with your secret key. And that tells you immediately that there is no link uh, unlinkability at the moment, right? If you use the same credential and the same public key in different presentations, you will be linkable by your own public key and by the credential of the issuer. The good thing is people are aware that this is not a good solution yet. Uh, what they propose and what is going to be rolled out uh, probably in the first version is to use batch issuance. So instead of getting only a single credential with these salted hashes, uh, you get 10 or 100 of one-time credentials all bound to different public keys of the user. And then when the user authenticates, she sends every time a fresh key and a fresh credential and throws it away afterwards. And if she's running out of credentials, she's going back again. 
And that does give you um, RP to RP unlinkability, but clearly we still do not have un any unlinkability if the issuer and the relying party collude, because they still can track you with the issuer that the issuer has seen during presentation and the, issue, the signature and, and public key you show at presentation. So what that now means is that we are building a solution in Europe at the moment that is not satisfying the unlinkability requirement as required uh, by the EIDAS um, regulation. And that was also the feedback that we gave with a couple of cryptographers when we invited in an ad hoc expert group last year. And we say, but don't worry, this current solution isn't going to work, but we actually have invented something that has all the privacy and unlinkability features built in. And these are called anonymous credentials. And in a nutshell, anonymous credentials kind of work just as classical certificates. <clears throat> so the user gets a, um, a signed list of her attributes and public key. But instead of sending over that exact uh, credential at presentation, the user only makes a zero knowledge proof. So she proves that she really has a credential and that she has the necessary underlying key material. And because it's a zero knowledge proof, um, it doesn't reveal anything beyond that, uh, its validity. So in, in that particular case, it doesn't reveal anything about the, the, the signature of the issuer or the user public or secret key. And apart from also having um, selective disclosure already built in, the great thing is that we can now really bootstrap multi-show unlinkability from a single credential. And we finally get the unlinkability or untraceability between issuance and presentation, because also um, you cannot link the zero knowledge proof back to the issued credential. And if you want to make different presentations, you just make a fresh zero knowledge proof every time from the same base credential that you have and the same public key and secret key you have. All right, and the way to build these signatures uh, or these anonymous credentials is to use a signature scheme that allows for efficient zero knowledge proof software. And um, one way to do that is to use a signature scheme that has these capabilities already built in. These are then the CL, BBS, and PS signatures. Or to use a more powerful tool like generic circuit-based zero knowledge proof compilers, and then you can actually use any signature scheme, in particular also legacy ECDSA. So that's kind of the main advantage of the second approach, but it comes with um, significantly um, more complexity and less efficiency com uh, compared to a solution that is built for that purpose. So in our um, cryptographer's feedback last year, we then um, recommended exclusively BBS because that at the time was the most mature, kind of complete and efficient solution for the problem at hand. All right, but if we have a solution that is kind of the perfect answer to what they're kind of looking for, and it was not particularly um, old, kind of the question is, why wasn't it used? And how can we change that? And the answer to that is, as usual, that the real world and cryptography are not as well aligned as we hope them to be. Um, but first, remember that this wallet needs to be available for 500 million users by the end of next year, which means it has to be built now from what is available today. And there are two main constraints that come into play here, um, because it's a digital identity, it's a, it's a national uh, document. The cryptography in there has to be approved in the SOGIS catalog, which is a catalog that uh, gives all algorithms approved by security bodies in Europe, and that immediately boils it down to ECDSA, HNO, and RSA. Um, and that list gets even shorter if we look at the second constraint, which says that the credential must also be device bound. Um, so device bound means that it should be bound through a hardware factor of the user, which makes cloning and sharing of credentials harder. And the EIDAS regulation even requires that has, that has to be on level of assurance high, which really means you have to have a secure element where your secret key lives and can never be exposed. And these secure elements basically only give you an ECDSA signing API. And that's where the limitation comes from. So what it also means, if we want to change something on the status quo, we have to address both problems. We have to find a way to do device finding with secure elements on the markets um, and get the crypto in the Zogus catalog. And in order to do that, we basically have a kind of two main paths we can approach now. The one is to say, let's use the cryptography that is the most established, the most mature, and try to push it through the entire deployment stack. The other one is to say, okay, let's go the path of least resistance in terms of deployment and start what's already out there with the devices that we have. We will not change that and build the entire stack on top of that. And I'll actually not talk too much about the second option because that is what the next four talks will exactly be about. Um, but that also shows that this is still a field of ongoing research. There are kind of tons of different protocols and approaches. And the question is also, how can we actually choose what the best protocol is? Do we need some sort of competition here? And do we have the time to do such a competition? But in both cases, as I said, we then have to get it into the Zogus approval. I'm not sure if you could see that on the previous slide, but Zogus basically references uh, mainly standards. It doesn't have to be a NIST standard. Um, ISO and, and ITF are good enough. And there, if we look at the BBS side of things, we are actually in a, in a reasonably good state. There are a couple of BBS IETF drafts um, at the moment for the core signature, <clears throat> for, for pseudonyms, and for blind issuance. And also an update of an old ISO standard from 2014 that already had BBS in there is currently planned. 
And while this is kind of great progress, I think it also shows kind of a, a challenge that we will always have when we try to um, standardize powerful cryptographic primitives, namely how do we do that? If you build a standard for every use case and variation, we end up with dozens of standards that redo a lot of work and kind of risk to be inconsistent with each other. But the other extreme, I think, is not an option either. A standard that is so powerful that it will enable all use cases is a standard that nobody wants to write or use either. So we might have to rethink the way we standardize these cryptographic primitives and rather have a standard for the kind of minimal core primitive and have a standard light process for all these use case and application specific variants on top of that. And this is going to be an even kind of bigger question, I think, for the uh, SNARK approach. But at least there's progress, um, because that is something uh, we cannot say about the pairing curve standard. Um, BBS, just like any other full-fledged um, full anonymous credential system, requires pairing friendly curves. And there was a standard out there uh, by the IDTF, but that expired in 2022, and it's dormant since. And this is already kind of a showstopper if we get that not um, revived soon. All right, but then if we look at the uh, CKSNARC side of things, um, there they already have a head start, because obviously ECDSA is well standardized and approved. But as I said, we also need to get standards for all the circuits, CK SNARKs, um, into a standard and into kind of security body approval. And depending on the CK SNARK that we're using, we might also need a pairing uh, curve standard. But then we are done with the right side of things, because as I said, there we started with a device binding kind of solved solution um, as, a, as a design. We still would have to solve that with BBS. Um, so what we need is to get the crypto in order to get a BBS proof of possession kind of uh, binding in there which cryptographically is not hard at all. So everything uh, gonna, that the um, secure element has to do is simply to compute a Schnorr signature over G1 of a pairing friendly curve. Trivial, but apparently this is a multi-year endeavor to get that into the real world. So also if anyone has any ideas kind of how we can kind of speed up that process or kind of do the process at all, um, this would be very helpful. Um, another option is kind of down to throw more crypto at that sub problem and just say, okay, maybe we just need a ZK snark that bridges the ECDSA proof of possession with a BBASM attribute credential on top. Because that would kind of allow us to work immediately with the devices on the market. Another option is always try to circumvent the problem and um, go for a cloud HSM solution. So also for instance, Germany is doing that in the first version of their wallet for different reasons. But that basically means you don't rely on the secure element on your phone for the proof of possession, but you rely on a cloud HSM service for that extra. And that would give us way more flexibility in terms of crypto we can deploy there. And trying to circumvent the problem um, is also an option um, for pairing. So if we think this is kind of a main bottleneck, we could also go for pairing three variants. There was a proposal from um, Oric out there since a year, and there's also a very recent ePrint that gives it a more formal uh, verification, which is called survey-aided anonymous credentials. And they basically trade uh, the pairing equation with interaction that the user has to do with the issuer. So there isn't in the trade of that kind of price we have to pay in terms of deployment and the pairing friendly version of it's still going to be the best in terms of security, privacy and, and deployment. So that brings me to the question whether anyone here is actually interested in picking the standard up. And it's not only needed for BBS and identity, but for, for all sorts of advanced uh, signature schemes or for, for Grow16. And if you want to have any serious deployment of them, it's serious meaning outside of a blockchain, you will need a standard that you can reference. And when you're doing that, it would also be great to figure out if we actually have any consensus on a 192-bit curve. Because that was a question that immediately came up when people were thinking about the midterm perspective of that. And talking about the midterm perspective, I think it's now also time to um, address the quantum elephant in the room. Because um, does it even make sense to deploy new crypto that is discrete logarithm-based, given that post-quantum transition is on everyone's mind? And if this would be about encryption, I think the clear answer would be no. But this is not about encryption, it's about authentication. And then we don't have the threat of store now, decrypt later. And even the NIST report from last year that says ECDSA has to be deprecated by 2035 said that for authentication systems, it's actually okay to continue to use classical quantum vulnerable algorithms until quantum computers that are capable of breaking them become actually available. And I mean, we heard yesterday from one of the Neptun Prize winners that this might take longer than some people might believe at the moment. So this raises again the question to us also as a community, how do we wanna make use of that leeway that we have for authentication systems? So do we wanna use it to also push the deployment of systems that are not quantum safe, but have other advantages, in particular in terms of privacy, or are we really saying we stop that now and everything that we deploy now in the real world has to be quantum safe? And I think if we do that, we are giving up too much in terms of privacy. Because this identity infrastructure is built now and not in 10 years. And it's being built with an ECDSA mindset. And if we don't change that, it means that this 
mindset with all the inherent privacy limitations will just manifest in the entire infrastructure that we are building now on top of that. So my proposal is still to go for a short midterm solution that is not quantum safe and really push it out now just to show the feasibility and the benefits of that approach and make sure the entire infrastructure is built on top of that. Also to help to shape the requirements and use cases in a meaningful way. Because we can already see now that there's not a good understanding of how security and privacy can coexist and can coexist in different shapes. Because when we look at the use cases that are kind of targeted with the first version of the wallet, um, yeah, we see that there's room for improvement. Um, so they target two main things. The one is the know your customer use case where I want to identify myself and I show all my identity. And another use case that they're aiming at are age proofs, where I just want to prove that I'm over 16 or 18, but I want to remain anonymous beyond that. And the solution that they have for both is batch issuance with one-time credentials and one-time signatures. But why do I need to be private when I open a bank account and send my uh, identity kind of over anyway? And why does my age proof has to have the same strong level of assurance as the credential that I'm using to open my bank account? And this discussion of what are the actual security and requirements for kind of a set of representative use cases is exactly what we have to do now and with the right technology in mind. And this becomes even more important if we look at all the use cases that are in between revealing my full identity and being fully anonymous, because that is where anonymous credentials can have the most impact. And starting to build that now, as I said, also enables to make sure that the entire infrastructure that we build on top actually is enabled or is powerful enough to take advantage of all the cryptographic features that we can build below. And it starts with something as benign as not requiring that the presentation that you sent over is a copy of your credential, which is kind of currently the case in some of the, and the protocols. And if we think ahead that we wanted to support something such as the conditional disclosure, blind issuance of pseudonyms, which is impossible to do with ECDSA, we can, I think, imagine that this will not be supported by any upper layer protocol unless it's really also there and there are use cases that make use of it. And finally, it also provides kind of a real concrete target for post-quantum research because we have invented dozens of variations and properties and we don't really know which are the most important one in practice and rolling it out, out as soon as possible will also give the, the post-quantum researchers a very concrete target what they have to focus first. And last but not least, and there's kind of really the attention of the European Commission on this at the moment. Um, so our open letter from, uh, from last year actually had an impact. So the European o Commission opens the discussion on zero knowledge proofs again. It just ended yesterday, unfortunately. Um, but um, now the technical specification is, is on their agenda. So they want to, or it's, they want to consider zero knowledge proofs for the next version of the ARF. And the technical specifications are drafted until end of August. So we really have to get something in there with the technology and what we can build today. And there's kind of links all over my, my presentation. There's the GitHub. So all of that is actually kind of public. You can engage there and, and shape the discussion. You can also reach out to your national identity teams because the wallets are still built by the different member states. So you can also reach out to them and try to shape the discussion through them. And uh, there's not only the kind of explicit zero knowledge proof discussion that could be interesting, but also other places. Um, for instance, the wallet attestation that you have to do in order to prove that not only your credential is valid, but you're using a valid wallet also has to be unlinkable, because otherwise we're going to lose privacy already at that level. And there are also many more interesting problems to cryptographers. So for instance, the first version for, uh, for batch issuance still tries to figure a way out how can we best derive many unlinkable ECDSA key, public keys from a single secret key, because that would help with the storage of one secret key and also the, the complexity of batch issuance. Yeah, so there's a lot of interesting problems um, to be solved where you can do cool research and have a real world impact. And if someone is interested in doing that in a postdoc in our group, please reach out. Thanks. I think we have time for one, maybe two questions. But I want to say, whom amongst us has not have uh, had unlinkability uh, autocorrected to unlikability? <laughs> um, please. Oh yeah. So read device binding with is this on? Yeah. Device binding with uh, with Schnorr on and the pairing group G1. I I kind of vaguely remember there was a sort of BAA light thing that Li Quin Chen proposed that I think went through ISO. So isn't there? already something in ISO about a Schnorr G1 with for, for some sort of DAA-like thing? Or am I just remembering wrong? Yeah, so for DAA, so we, yeah, there is DAA out there that basically runs only the device binding on the secure element, which is just a Schnorr signature, but it has to be on G1 on the pairing-friendly curve. Are, are you so kind of saying that there is already something out there that takes a P256 and bridges it to G1? Because that would be perfect. Uh, not but P256, we, but, yeah, but, so yeah, the, but I think there is a standard which does Schnorr on G1. Exactly. So that, 
Okay. Yeah, that is DAA kind of over again. Yeah, um, but that should already be on the device, yeah? It should already. No, it's on the TPMs, but not in secure elements. 